Dr. Mario is one of my favorite puzzle games to go back to on the Game Boy or NES. As fun as it is though, from a scientific perspective, the entire execution of this game doesn't make much sense. The premise is fairly simple. Dr. Mario is running a research lab where the experimental viral strains he's working with have started to spread. The plan of action to prevent them from spreading further is treating them with a newly developed set of vitamins in pill form. This all sounds easy enough, but if you've ever been to see a doctor and they suspect that a virus is the cause of what's ailing you, they'll send you home for plenty of rest and lots of liquids since viruses usually don't respond well to drugs. Before we start questioning Dr. Mario's credentials, let's talk about viruses and what makes them so different from other kinds of disease-causing organisms. First, viruses are actually considered to be non-living. If you're wondering how they can do anything without sentience, they've evolved very unique mechanisms that require taking over and controlling other living things to do their evil bidding. To be classified as a living thing, something has to have organization and structure, metabolize, grow and reproduce, maintain homeostasis by adapting to their environment, and respond to stimuli. Viruses usually only have one of these traits, and that's organization. All viruses have a very similar physical and biochemical structure where there's some genetic information enclosed within a layer of lipids and proteins, but apart from that, they can't metabolize, reproduce, grow, or respond to stimuli on their own. Dr. Mario's lab viruses are not like this at all. They're more physically complex with differentiated parts like arms and legs, they move around freely, and they respond to stimuli with their nasty little faces whenever they're affected by the pills raining down. They're also reproducing since there are more and more of them every round, but the interesting part is that they seem to be doing this independently of a host. A host can be any living thing that the virus can successfully get inside of and then hijack to multiply. Under normal circumstances, a viral infection begins in a single host cell. A cell is an independent living unit and a paradise for viruses looking to take things over. When viruses first enter a new host, they'll infect a single cell by forcing their way in. Host cells are very difficult to penetrate, so viruses normally fuse with or inject important information through the cell's membrane to bypass that barrier. Once inside, the virus will hijack the cell's machinery, making more of itself until so many of them have accumulated that the cell that they're occupying bursts open, causing the death of the cell. Once released, the new viruses can go off and infect new host cells and continue the cycle infinitely. Now, because viral infections are happening inside of cells rather than outside of them, viruses are very difficult to treat with medications. A cell's membrane is very difficult to breach, and movement of things into or out of a cell is very highly controlled. Viruses obviously force their way in, but things like drugs can't enter without permission from the cell. If medications taken orally or injected into the body can't easily infiltrate host cells, they definitely can't reach and kill the viruses inside of them either. Because of this, Dr. Mario's means of hitting these viruses with as many pills as possible would only be able to affect any that had recently been released out of exploded cells, leaving ones multiplying in other cells to persist over time. Another problem stems from the fact that viruses have a very high mutation rate, meaning that they're constantly changing. Even if these vitamin treatments were effective against these viruses, they wouldn't be for very long. Drugs are usually developed for a specific target or feature of an infectious organism, so after a mutation or two, the drugs would no longer work. Dr. Mario's medicine also seems to need a bit of tweaking since a very high dose is required to even kill a single virus. There are clearly more laboratory tests needed to refine this method of treatment. You might be wondering why any of this even matters at all since the viruses in this game are clearly not in a host and look like they're being housed in a bottle. Even Princess Toadstool's presenting them to Dr. Mario in this way in the manual, and this doesn't make any sense either. Viruses grown up in a laboratory setting still have to be raised inside of living things, and this can be done with lab animals or in tissue culture where mammalian cells are grown in plates or flasks. Most viruses can't live outside of a host for more than a few minutes, if that, and almost always require moisture to remain viable. This is why, contrary to popular belief, very few viral infections can be contracted from something like a toilet seat. Many viral infections are usually only transmitted between different hosts from contact with someone else's bodily fluids. 
Now, despite all of the good science we've talked about here, the viruses in the game are alive and well, living in that flask as the pills keep coming. There are a few reasons that might explain this. First, the viruses might not be viruses at all. Other types of infectious organisms, like fungi and bacteria, can live independently of a host, exhibit all characteristics of living things, and would respond well to treatment with medications in pill form. A simple misclassification might be at work here. Another thing that supports this idea is that the viruses shown in this game are enormous compared to what an actual virus as we know them might look like. Bacteria and fungi are also both significantly larger than viruses, so they might actually be what Dr. Mario is studying. It wouldn't be surprising if a translation error might be at play here. Alternatively, the organisms we're seeing in these bottles might be serving as the host organisms being used to grow up the actual viruses being studied. Although less likely, since we do see a drop in numbers every time one of them is killed with the pills, it would still explain a lot. The third idea is that these are not the viruses you'd normally find on Earth or in an Earth-like world like the Mushroom Kingdom. There are a few snippets of backstory between levels in Dr. Mario that show a few viruses on top of a tree, looking into the sky as if they're waiting for something, so they very well may be of some alien origin and defy all rules and conventions we've discussed here. That opens up an entirely different can of worms that we could talk about forever, but it is a possibility nonetheless. So as it stands, we can't quite be sure if Dr. Mario's viruses are really viruses at all based on how far they diverge from the viruses that we know, or whether or not they might actually be alien creatures that have come to the Mushroom Kingdom for unknown reasons. Either way, we're all very grateful for Dr. Mario and Nurse Toadstool in their pursuits of science. If nothing else, they at least pique the interest and curiosity of children everywhere about medication, illness, and how we fight infection.